Please welcome to the stage, Bon and Bo. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me get the clicker. Hello, Miami. How are you? Come on, a little bit more. Hello, Miami. How are you? NCA, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, so my name is Bon and Bao, and I am the chief media and e-commerce officer for Mondelez International. Uh, usually when I present, I sometimes have to explain who we are, but I'm sure you guys are well aware um, of who we are. I had on a shirt before, but they told me I had to wear a jacket. Uh, and this is the only jacket I have with you. <laughs> Weird, I thought they'd be sweeter about how they approach their speakers. No, uh, so um, in my responsibilities, I'm responsible for driving our media buying globally, um, as well as building our billion dollar e-commerce business, which we announced uh, September, uh, our official plan September of, of last year. Uh, but today what I wanna talk to you about is this idea of hack economy, really about how do you begin to create value by breaking things? And a lot of that is driven by an approach which our CMO, Dana Anderson, if you've never seen her speak, she's amazing. She's also probably the best CMO on the planet. A big uh, I'm a big fan of hers and friend. But she challenged us three years ago to be fearless, to become the most fearless marketers on the planet, and to think different about how we communicate our brands to consumers. And that's what I believe we've done. But what I want to do is I want to start off with a little history lesson on the industry in general. So, if you were a marketing executive in the 1950s, and I came into your office and I said, look, I really want you to buy this thing called television. You would laugh me out of your office and tell me that this thing called radio works really well. I don't need your television. But three brave marketers, P&G, Unilever, and Kraft, made a decision to jump into TV because they saw that consumer consumption began to eclipse where industry investment was going. And as a result, they built competitive advantages that transformed their businesses for years to come as I'm sure you all know. I believe that we're facing the exact same thing and it deals with mobile. In fact, 23% of all media is consumed on a mobile device, but less than 1% of spending goes there. Which means that the boardrooms of most organizations look something like this. There's probably a CEO at the front that says, you know, I think we may need a mobile strategy. And then finally somebody looks up from their phone very distracted and said, I'm sorry, but did you say something? But what's great is that it's not just an example of boardrooms, but of society at large. We have become the most distracted society in human history. But what's amazing about humans is they'll never admit that they're distracted. They'll say, no, keep talking to me while I'm texting because I'm doing something that I call multitasking. Multitasking. Well, they're lying to you. There was a study that was done by the American Psychiatric Association. What they did was they took two groups. They asked one to use mobile phones and multitask, and they asked the second group to smoke marijuana. There was a 10-point drop in the IQ of those that use mobile phones to multitask, which was twice as much as those that smoke marijuana. So the point is, you're better off being a pothead than pretending that you can multitask. But even in the face of all of these specific examples, I still get the same question from senior leaders all the time. They go, Bonin, is mobile at scale? I said, okay. So we did a little research. It turns out there are 7 billion people on Earth 5.1 billion own a cell phone, but only 4.2 billion own a toothbrush. <laughs> Which means two things. One, there's a billion people that didn't get the text message on the importance of hygiene. And two, that if we believe toothbrushes are at scale, then clearly mobile phones are. But what's interesting even more than that is the pace of growth and adoption that we've seen of these devices. It took 38 years for radio to reach 50 million people, 13 for TV, four for the computer, and two just for the iPhone which might arguably be the third most important operating system, and it might actually go uh, Google and then Microsoft. Any Microsoft people in the room? I always say that for them. It's not going to be the truth, but it gets them happy. It gives them something to look forward to. Anyway, <laughs> uh, but we still haven't adopted. In fact, more phones are turned on every single day than babies are being born, but yet organizations are slow to move. I love this. It says, honk if you love Jesus, text while driving if you want to meet him. Even our religious institutions understand the power of mobility, but yet big organizations still haven't locked onto it. How many people in here have ever felt their phone vibrating, but when they reached in their pocket, it wasn't? Raise your hand. Oh, everybody felt that. Everybody raise your hand. It's not just you. There's actually a disease. It's called phantom vibration syndrome. And they say that people who experience this have a tactile hallucination that's vaguely similar to what meth addicts go through. 
that's a drug. There's actually other studies that show using your mobile device and social media is as addictive as cocaine. So that means Twitter and Facebook might just be gateway drugs and there's somebody in a dark alley saying, send me 140 characters, I just need a status update, please give me a status update. And while we're strung out on mobility, we have this man to blame. <laughs> nice white haired gentleman, Martin Cooper, who in the early 80s invented the mobile phone. But what's interesting is what he thought he was creating was a device for us to share voice wirelessly. But what he didn't realize was he was creating a world of connected devices that would transform finances, businesses, and society at large. Bain did a study, and he said that by 2020, every single consumer packaged good that's sold inside of a supermarket will be connected to the internet somehow. That means that many of us who run big organizations, and even those that run small, we might become some of the largest technology companies on the planet. And what worries me is that we don't look like a technology company. We're not cool bikes like Google. We don't run around like Snapchat. We're not buzzing off the wall like Twitter. So how do we begin to prepare organizations to think differently? How do we build the capabilities necessary to take advantage of this next wave of growth? And we've already seen it happen to countless industries that have been put out to pasture, whether it's books, whether it's hotels, whether it's car rental. How do we make sure that we find out how to disrupt ourselves before we're disrupted? The other thing that worries me is that the institutions that were built to train an earlier generation of leaders are not built to train a new generation. Less than 1% of the course descriptions of the top 100 business schools even use the word mobile, emerging, or digital technology in the course descriptions. So we're graduating MBAs into the marketplace that are not prepared to be leaders of this generation. And then when they come inside of our organizations, we tell them, hey, we want innovation. But in reality, what we want is incrementality. We want to reduce risk. We get nervous. And so we beat that out of them. So how do we rethink the culture behind our organizations? And how do we transform and grow our businesses in new ways? So what I did was I wanted to look at what is happening with fast growing small emerging technology companies. Well, the one thing is, is that they've been able to create greater value at a faster pace than even organizations that have been around for 100 years. And Radio Shack is no longer around. Um, sorry, Radio Shack. The other thing is that it also has nothing to do with time. So here's a company called Mailbox that was bought for $100 million in less than four months. I'll take that all day long. It also has nothing, I will if anybody wants to give me $100 million. No. Uh, it also has nothing to do with size of teams. So here are 13 people who created Instagram that was bought for a billion dollars. It also has nothing to do with industry. Even industrial industries are being revolutionized. Here's MakerBot that was sold for $403 million. And when you look at companies like GE who have really taken on the 3D printing revolution and are transforming their business. It also has nothing to do with location. There are over 100 cities that look something like Silicon Valley, Silicon Alley, Silicon Lane, Silicon Beach, Silicon River. You'd think with all of this creativity, they come up with something better than Silicon something. But apparently, that's what they're going for. It also has nothing to do with age. Every single one of these kids has one thing in common. They're all founders. The kid on your far left created an app called Bustin' Jeeber. Bustin' Jeeber, that's the app he created. You guys laugh. He gave a TED Talk, and I'm here talking to the NCA. You know what I mean? That's kind of. That's where my career's at. I just want to level set with you guys. It also has nothing to do with education. Peter Thiel is literally paying kids not to go to college because he believes he can unlock greater value than even our educational institutions can. And he might be right. If you think about it, Zuckerberg dropped out. Sergey dropped out. Carp doesn't even have a high school diploma, and he sold Tumblr to Yahoo for a billion dollars. Now I know what you're saying. Marissa Mayer will buy anything. But that's not the point. <laughs> she will, no. Uh, even rock stars are saying that coders are the new cultural beacons that we should follow. And that might be right when we look at those things that document culture. You see Biz Stone on the cover of Billboard, Jobs on the cover of Rolling Stone, you see on Cosmo, Bonin on Campaign. Come on. No respect, this crowd is so tough. <laughs> Candy guys, uh, confectioners. Uh, so I asked myself, What's going on? What's underlining this? What's happening? What can we learn as an industry and how can we bring that to life? So one is this idea of the hacker. 
this idea that rules are meant to be broken, this idea that our journey, and you talk to Facebook, they'll tell you our journey is only 1% complete. We still have more stuff to break. We still have more things to hack. Finding new routes to change their future. And so I believe that we're sitting in front of what I've been terming a hackonomy, a place where we can create value by breaking things, breaking ourselves, breaking our organizations, breaking our process. And some of the best things on the planet have been created by hackathons. In fact, the like button was created in 48 hours by a hackathon. Here's a company that's trying to hack the airline industry, open airplane. They believe they could be the Uber of airline travel. Now, I travel all the time, but I'm never like, oh, I need a car. Oh, five minutes away, the airplane. Okay, let me. Not all ideas will work, is my point there. Here's a guy named Stellog who's actually hacking humanity. So he's put an implanted ear in his arm, and inside of that ear, he's got a Bluetooth microphone so that when his phone rings, he can answer by speaking into his arm. Hello? Hello? Can you hear me now? Ear, here. That joke never works. Um, never. Uh, but I keep going. I'm going to get it one day. Uh, inside of his mouth, he's got speakers uh, so that when somebody talks, he actually moves his mouth and it looks like somebody else is talking, like another, another voice is actually coming out of his mouth. But the whole point is he's hacking our notion of humanity, and people are breaking what we expect every single day. Here's another guy, Hugh Hare, who's actually hacking humanity for a different reason, and his reason is to turn disability into ability. His story is very simple. When he was 16, he was considered one of the most world-renowned mountain climbers. He got caught in a blizzard with his best friend. His best friend died. He lost both of his legs. A week after he came back from the hospital with his prosthetics, his brother, seeing how much he needed to climb, took him out climbing. On that climbing trip, he chipped the toe on his prosthetic. But then he realized that, oh, he could actually climb better. So he came back and he began to hack his prosthetic limbs until he created limbs that actually allowed him to climb better than with his real limbs. At that point, he was a D student, but he decided to dedicate himself to turning disability into ability. Now, as a doctorate professor at MIT, he's created the first bionic limbs, which he believes he will get down to a cost of about $3,000 uh, in the next couple of years, truly transforming, um, sorry, truly transforming the medical profession. Um, what's interesting is I saw him speak at a conference. I spoke, he spoke after. And one of the people in the crowd asked, they said, do you ever see a time when somebody would opt to have a, pros a, a prosthetic limb or a bionic limb over their natural limb? And he said, well, let me ask you this. If you were 75 years old and your arthritic arm didn't operate like your 18-year-old one did, what would you do? And it was kind of a hush over the crowd because at that moment, everybody began to realize that we might be entering a world where we might even become more computer than we actually are human. So the hacks of the world are coming. Here is... Amy Webb, who actually hacked the internet to find the man of her dreams. She, so, she reverse engineered her social network until she found love, and then she wrote a book about it. So even our most intimate relationships are being hacked on a daily basis. So that brings us to us and why we're here. What I want to share with you is how we've approached hacking media. How have we broken down the way media has been done for years? So first is we have to rethink mobile. The mobile device is no longer just a channel, but it's a piece of uh, it's a personal device that consumers have with them every single day. Even more, it can interact with other forms of media, television, out of home, in store. So how do you begin to rethink that? Real-time engagement. So one is about having conversations in real time on social media, but what I think is more important is how organizations will have to become real-time manufacturers. How do we begin in an on-demand economy to be able to create products that consumers want at the time that they want it? So how do we re-engineer our entire organization to operate in real time? I'll show some examples. Monetizing media. There used to be a day when advertisers like P&G owned the soap operas. They actually made money off their media investments. How do we begin to, to bring that back? And more important, what I think it does is it sets a new bar for quality. Everybody tells me, Bonin, brand is publisher, brand is publisher. Brands aren't publishers right now. Brands just have a lot of money to put stuff into the marketplace. Publishers get paid for the content they create, either by consumers or by advertisers, which means they have to hold themselves up to a better quality. It's not about how big the logo is, but how quality the content is that consumers are willing to actually pay for. Right now, there's actually technology created so that consumers avoid our ads. It's called the skip button. Oh, okay, and it tells you, in seven seconds, you'll be able to skip this thing that you really don't want to see that's actually funding all of Google. Thank you, Google, for that. Aspiration versus allocation. It's one thing to aspire to be a social media marketer or a new type of marketer, but it's another thing to actually spend behind it, to allocate the resources necessary to change your consumer communications. TV versus video, it's one and the same. How do we look across the board and see television and video as one thing? Consumers hop 
from device to device, but they're still watching content, but yet we get stuck in this one uh, uh, platform called television. And by the way, I believe TV is more important than ever. We're still, that's a significant portion of our buy. Um, culture versus cluster. We no longer have to look at clusters of consumers that we think look similar, but we can actually look at cultural underpinnings that tie those consumers together and communicate with them on a deeper level. So let's look at some examples. First, when we wanted to become the number one mobile marketer two years ago, we dedicated ourselves to investing behind it with a platform called Getting to 10. So we have shifted successfully 10% of all of our media money into mobility, and I think we're going to grow uh, even more over the next, between now and 2020. Well, not I think, I know. Um, I think the mix looks something like almost 30% when you just begin to think about the amount of time that consumers are spending on that device. But we also needed a roadmap, a roadmap that gave clear direction to our organization on where the places that they should play in mobility are. So the first was reach. It's an extension of reach. We know that. So how do we use it to build more reach? Engagement. We have the opportunity to now use it as an engagement platform, even with our base television. In fact, when we use Twitter and TV together, we see two times the return on investment. So how do we begin to plan them together? Media and impulse. It's the one device that the consumers have with them when they're right in front of the point of distribution. So how do we begin to let this device become an impulse driver for our purchases? And I can talk a little bit about that. We see 10% lift in store when we target on impulse. We've seen between 20 and 30% around store. Um, so big numbers. Loyalty. Loyalty is a big opportunity for us. Right now, if you think about it, we drop our products off at the retailer and we say, good luck, little product. I hope you sell. Good luck. We no longer have a relationship. Why don't I know the email or cell phone number of every single Oreo buyer on the planet? Why don't I know that? How do we begin to build loyalty relationships that matter, that really drive repeat purchase, that allow us to bring new consumers into the category? Here's a little thing that we did, which is a combination of mobile and media monetization. And I recommend you guys look at uh, platforms like this. So one, I believe that our brands have so much staying power that they can carry more than just a product, but they can actually carry IP bigger than just the products that we sell. Here's a game we created. It's called Twist, Lick, and Dunk. And the story's simple. Two brands came to me before, and they said, Bonin, we want to build mobile games. I said, great, let me introduce you to some folks that build mobile games for a living. They said, no, no, no. We want to use our agencies. I said, look, I love our agencies, but they don't build mobile games. So they went off and did that without me. Uh, so one spent uh, half a million, the other a million. I think one got 16,000 downloads, one got 64,000 downloads. I was so upset that I went and found a brand manager who would partner with me with a real game developer, and we built Twist, Lick, and Dunk. Um, it, it, $250,000, there were three rules. One is, don't desecrate the Oreo because I will be fired and I will hunt you down. Two, if you can get the ritual of twist, lick, and dunk in, great. But three, most important, make the game make money. Hold us up to a higher standard. And you can't really see it underneath the thumb there, but we actually sell ads in the game. Long story short, 12 million downloads, number one app in 12 countries, by far the largest branded game in history. 20 billion Oreos have been ducked. But more important is that the game actually makes me money. So I'm now cash positive. I make money back from advertisers advertising in the game, which allows me to build this continuous uh, uh, cycle. So I would definitely start to think about how do you use the IP of your brands in new ways. Um, a lot of you are familiar with the work that we did um, or about three years ago. Uh, when we began to transform our, our cookie brand, uh, Oreo, into social media. Uh, and this is from some work that we did on the 100th anniversary, and we did 100 uh, different shots. And many of you guys are familiar with some of the work that we did on Twitter when the lights went out uh, during the Super Bowl. But what I don't think you know is how we operationalize that so that we now can execute that as an organization around the globe. Here's an example of a brand. It's called Nilla Wafers, which I'm sure many of you know. And our building, we call Nilla an entrepreneurial brand which means, good luck, you have no money, be entrepreneurial. We gave you a good title, right? Uh, so what we decided to do with Nilla was we were going to use no other platform but Facebook. And we started off by saying we no longer have to do creative in the same exact way. So first, we brought our insights folks in, and we found out every single thing that we could buy against, every attribute based on everything that we knew about the consumer. If you think about it, right now we take big insights. We know everything about the Oreo buyer, but when we go to actually buy media, we'll tell them they wake up on the left side of the bed, they wear a blue shirt, da 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 and then they go, okay, great, mom's 18 to 34. You're like, wait a second, where's the granularity here? So we started off with some granularity. The other thing was we decided to let the consumers drive the creative decisions that we were making. So we created five pieces of creative, and we put them into the wild. And the more consumers engaged, we created a bunch of these in this vein continuously. The more they engage, those are the ones that we focus on the more, and the less we killed those off. So this is the campaign that won. It's called Momisms. It's th this is the first one. The best families are like fudge, mostly sweet with lots of nuts. 
Uh, then we learned that if we actually had illustrations on it, they did better. Here's a few more. Good moms let you lick the beaters. Great moms turn them off. <laughs> if you want breakfast in bed, sleep in the kitchen. And then we got cultural, hey, Jay-Z, thanks for stocking your villa with Nilla. And then we became more relevant. Your kid's a royal, mine's a royal pain. And what's interesting is with uh, sorry, $620,000, we were able to move a $140 million business by 9%. It's actually 9.8%, but my legal makes me round down. So that's what you got. Uh, we've also taken that into video. So how do you begin to look at video and social together? I'm going to play a clip and then come back and talk about it. A little brought to you by credit is usually it. But tonight, we have a product too important. Because tonight, it's Wheat Thins. <laughs> wheat Thins, crunch is calling. And the call is coming from inside your mouth. Get out of there. <laughs> now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Stephen, how important could Wheat Thins be? Yeah. I used to think that way, too. <laughs> Until I received this actual memo from Wheat Thins. Detailing for my sponsorship purposes what the role of Wheat Thins is in our lives. <laughs> now, let me tell you something. You think you know Wheat Thins? <laughs> F you. <laughs> F you and the cracker you wrote in on. Okay? Now listen up. <laughs> So that was great. He was so tired of the revisions, he wrote back and he said, look, I'm just going to read the brand brief on air, take it or leave it. And we're like, uh, I guess we'll take it. But what's interesting is we had a team lined up before. This was the first time that Viacom allowed us to do a thing called clip and share, where we could clip 15 to 30 second clips and share it on Twitter. And you can imagine, this is seven minutes actually, I only showed a little piece. You can imagine how this exploded and how viral it became. When we stepped back and looked at the results, we actually got greater reach, almost 2x, on Twitter from sharing the clips than we did on our base uh, advertising. So it began to make us, and that was kind of slightly planned. But what we did was we stepped back and said, imagine if we plan campaigns connected like that from the beginning. And here's an example of some recent work that kind of embodies this connected planning approach. If I had to describe my parents, my dad would be like the smart one and everything. And then my papa would be, he's a funny one. <laughs> it's just me and him. We kind of take it as, all right, this is, this is all we got. This is our team right here, and nothing's going to break this team up. American families have changed. Sometimes we get looks just from being a mixed family. And while they may look different, they're still as wholesome as ever. And who better to say this than the beloved brand American families grew up with? Honeymade. Everyday wholesome snacks for every wholesome family. This campaign was the first time an American brand had so clearly stood up for all families. This is wholesome and the nation took notice. Honeymade featuring both interracial and gay parents in an ad for graham crackers that's been viewed more than five million times. Honeymade's hashtag, this is wholesome on fire. But unfortunately, a lot of people didn't agree with our message. We were threatened with a boycott. We were called sinful. Even the right-wing conservative group, One Million Moms, calling the ad a, quote, attempt to normalize sin. But instead of backing down, we asked two artists to take every negative tweet, comment, and post, print them out, roll them up, and turn hate into love. And the best part was all the positive messages we received. Over 10 times as many. With over 270,000 shares on social media, this simple video earned over 250 million impressions from social and PR alone. And for the week it launched, it was the most shared commercial in the world. Perhaps a chart showing Google searches for Honeymade over the last 10 years says it best. Honeymade. In less than one month, it went from a cracker people love to a brand people love.
piece of work that Gary Oshitskin, when he was running Honeymade, did. Uh, it wasn't planned, but we were prepared for connected response, and as a result, that's the piece of work that you see. Um, I'm going to show one more example, actually two more examples, and then let you guys go. Um, here's a piece of work that talks to being more than just a real-time marketer, but being able to create products in real time. So what we did here was we created the first ever 3D printed Oreo machine. Um, I'll let the video play, and then I'll come and explain what it turned into after. Mm, play the video. Mm, was I supposed to cue you? Can you hear me in the back? OK. Oh, no, 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 no. That's the patch. It's the Oreo video. Sorry, guys. We got it. No, it's all good. It was a little, they had to pull it from the web. So here we are. And uh, <laughs> I'll tell the story so we don't burn through time. So you're going to see them show the video of the Oreo 3D printed machine. Um, and what's interesting is that we actually created a printer that printed Oreo cookies in real time based on what was trending on Twitter. So consumers could come and actually select the trend and then actually taste the Oreo. So if the daily twist, which was the rainbow cookie, was how you could see culture through the eyes of an Oreo, we wanted you to actually be able to taste culture through a product. Um, so here's the video. Go. South by Southwest Interactive in Austin, Texas. We invited festival goers to the Trending Vending Lounge to participate in an experiment. What would happen if your Oreo cookie joined the social network? Our prototype vending machines take what's trending on Twitter and turns those trends into custom Oreos. Using unique transparent touchscreens, users scroll through a list of trending topics, each related to a particular flavor combination and pattern. Advanced algorithms translate the tweets into custom cookies. In all, there are about 10,000 possible combinations. Users can also mash up two trends to further customize their experience. The resulting cookie combines elements of the two original trends. Once the user hits Make Cookie, the real magic happens. Using some repurposed 3D printing technology and a pneumatic pump system, we've enabled festival attendees to watch as their custom cookie is robotically printed and assembled. Final cookie is dropped into a cup, vended, and is now ready to enjoy. Apparently, she likes it. it yes, it tastes like the Oreo cookies that you know and love. Um, but what's interesting about that, it begins to, first of all, people waited online for two and a half hours at what is uh, arguably the most cynical event on the planet. Angry bloggers standing online for two and a half hours because they wanted to be able to customize their experience with a brand that they've known for their entire lives. So it began us on this journey of thinking. And what was more interesting is that one of our food scientists was so amazed by the consumer feedback. And what's also interesting is 10,000 different versions. So imagine being able to now do high throughput product testing in real time with consumers. So just think about that when you begin to think about how do you operationalize things in a different way. But what it led us to was consumers want custom. And so we actually launched this Christmas, or last Christmas, last holiday season, for the first time ever, a direct-to-consumer product. The first time Oreo in 103 years has shipped directly to consumers. So you could go online, you could choose from two different artists, you could color in every single aspect of the photo, you could stretch it. So every single uh, package that we sent was unique. Uh, you could choose from different words like world, joy. Uh, you could choose little hats and scarves. You could write a message in the top of the, of the pack. Uh, and then we ship this to consumers. What's brilliant about this is that we also got consumers to have an experience with Oreo. When it came to their door, it was in this beautiful package. So now they were experiencing the brand in ways they didn't. 
from a, a business perspective, they were actually paying 3x what they would pay for, for a base Oreo cookie uh, for a customized cookie. So you can begin to think about the implications this has um, from a, a, a business driving and growth perspective. Um, this is something that's, I'm sure, close to every single one of your hearts and a brand that I love so much. Probably one of the fastest growing brands in terms of growth of the category in candy is Sour Patch. What I love about Sour Patch is that the brand decided to take an entirely different approach and said, you know what, let's look at these new and emerging channels that are driving the youth culture and let's be a part of it. Can a candy actually be famous? So how do you be famous in this world? Well, you hang out with famous people. So let's connect with Vine stars. Let's connect with YouTube celebrities. You say things that are unique. Okay, let's make the kid have a unique personality that no other candy on the planet has. You, 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 be, you create a place where culture is created. Okay, let's create places where culture is created. And as a result, you have the new Sour Patch kind of communication reimagined. I'm gonna take you to one piece. There's so many great pieces here, whether it's Teen Choice, whether it's the work with It's Sugar, whether it's the work with 7-Eleven, oh, so on and so on and so forth. I'm gonna talk about one program called The Patch. The Patch is a simple idea, which is there are all these emerging artists that are creating youth culture, and they're touring every single day, and the single largest expense that they have when they go on tour is housing. So how can Sour Patch create a platform where artists can actually come and stay and create and be a part of the brand in a new way that's never been done before. So we launched the patch. The patch is pretty simple, it's three houses. Now you begin to think about the patch and this idea. The place you used to call home before was home, then it was crib, then it was pad. Imagine if a candy brand could actually create a culture moniker around patch. And, and kids, youth culture begins to call the place that they live now the patch. And what does that mean in retail? What does that mean uh, you know, to the future of brand communication? So this is just the beginning. And so basically they've had 275 artists that have stayed at all three patch houses. They come, they create content, they create songs. It's like they believe that they've made it because the houses are like rock stars. So we treat them like the rock stars that they're going to be. The great thing is that so many of those artists are now number one selling Grammy artists. And guess who they thank for a lot of that success? Guess who they're grateful to? This little candy called Sour Patch. Here's an example of ex-ambassadors when they recorded at the patch. Oops, sorry, oops. Here, here's, here's more examples of the patch. Uh, so this is Ad Week uh, talking about how great it is. You can see it. Here's it. What's going on? We are ex ambassadors. We're here at the patch. We love being on the road. That's that's where we thrive. We're in a sound check. We're gonna play a show, really connect with some of our fans. Always feel like you've accomplished at least something in your day. We 100 percent write and create on the road. You can't not do that. You also can't avoid it. As a musician and as, a, as an artist, you know, going through that creative process, when you have that eureka moment, it's amazing. Hi, I am Josh Rowe. I have been painting murals for about six or seven years now. I'm Sophie Roach. I'm an artist and illustrator. Josh Rowe called me and said that there was a really cool project happening in Austin. I just kind of go for it and just start drawing. I wanted to do something that had a lot of energy. There's no like rhyme or reason to it. It's just like shapes and letters. Obviously, I wanted to rep Austin. If anyone didn't know they were on the east side, they could just look at this wall and kind of figure it out. So, we lost a little time, so I'm just gonna skip that. It goes through the rest of the song. They talk a little bit. What was interesting is artists said to us, they said, you know what's the hardest thing about being on tour? I can't do my laundry. Thank you for allowing me to do my laundry. I can't get a home-cooked meal. Thank you for making me feel like I can get a home-cooked meal and that I'm at home. Thank you for allowing other artists, so we bring artists, local artists, to come in and collaborate with me so I can be inspired and create again. And so what I think is great about the patch is that it's really about thinking differently around how you communicate with a new generation. How do you use culture creators to create around your brand and with your brand versus for your brand? 
Uh, and so that's why I'm very proud of the work that Sour Patch has done in the patch. But none of this is possible unless you have the right culture as an organization. So what I want to leave you with is how we've been able to approach hacking culture, actually instilling inside of our organization a culture of entrepreneurship. The fact that every single one of the people who work for us can be an entrepreneuring young marketer and change the world themselves. Here's a simple platform. This is one of many ways Fearless that sits underneath the Fearless umbrella. But here's a program called Mobile Futures. And what we did was this is the first mobile accelerator. We wanted to take startups and match them with brands and have our marketers go and actually work for the startups for two weeks. And then they had to bring a project to life within 90 days. We just launched another version called Shopper Futures, which looks at how mobility is transforming uh, the shopping experience with many of our retail partners. This has been launched around the world uh, in many countries. But that unique opportunity for the marketers to go and work for the startup for two weeks changes the way that they think. Here's a great example. Um, this is Catherine Schieffer. Uh, this is an article in Inc. It says, early this year, Catherine Schieffer made her daily commute to Palo Alto, California offices of Waze, a startup that makes a social navigation app from her seat at a long communal table next to Waze CEO, Noam Borden, who also had his company bought for a billion dollars. Uh, she made phone calls, reviewed mock-ups of the apps, and participated in marathon brainstorming sessions. Schieffer, however, isn't an employee of Waze. She's an associate brand manager at Stride Gum which is owned by Mondelez International, just showing that type of integration. You can imagine, the first time this article came out, she sent it to her mom, she said, Mom, I'm on top of the world, I've made it. So much excitement that it brings to them. In fact, every single one, here's examples from the immersions, every single one of the marketers, they all came back after those two weeks and they said the same thing to me. They said, Bonin, should we go and work for a startup? I said, no, because if nine of our top marketers quit, I'll be fired, I like my job, we need to focus, people. We really need to focus here. I said, instead, imagine taking what you learned and bringing that to big resources, to big brands, to something that's expansive. How can you be an entrepreneur inside of our organization? When we look at the marketing plans now, they look vastly different. Farah, who runs Sour Patch, uh, you know, came through this program as well. What's also interesting is that they've built networks. They don't have to take the word of the agency that's sitting across them. They can actually pick up the phone and call Brian Wrong, who runs Keep, and ask his point of view. They built networks of people who understand what this next generation of platforms uh, look like. And so I'll leave you with this last piece. I have a book coming out in two weeks where it's all on mobility. It's 120 interviews that looks at every single aspect of how mobiles change society from dating to parenting, you name it. Um, but what we realized was that it wasn't enough because this transformation that mobile's having to society is so vast that just asking 120 people wasn't enough and there hasn't been a definitive study on the marketplace yet. So what I decided to do was launch a book and put my number on the cover and I'm asking consumers to have dialogue with me around how this device is impacting the way they want to be communicated to, the way that their lives are changing, and we will, as an organization, have the single largest definitive study in terms of how consumers see mobile fitting into their lives and where brands should be a part of that. And so I leave you with this. Alan Kay said that the best way to predict the future was to invent it, but I would argue that the best way to predict the future is to hack it. So thank you guys so much. It's been a pleasure. It's been a real pleasure, a real pleasure.